Roger, it's very nice to talk to you in this strange interview format. Uh, someone I've talked to for ooh, 42 a long, years. A long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're rehearsing all sorts of things that have come up during that period. And I suppose my thought goes immediately to time. I mean, you're, everything you've done seems to be like defeating time in one way or another. Being defeated by it normally. Well, I don't think so. I think you've defeated it more than most people could ever have done. I don't know whether you remember my office where I used to have a <laughs> clock that went backwards. Well, that would, be, that would be a good motif if we wanted one in the background, I think. Um, but certainly we're thinking about hmm, second law of thermodynamics and the mystery <laughs> of time direction and our consciousness and our awareness of the past. And so we can only talk about the past, unfortunately. It's a great uh, disadvantage that we have. But I was thinking perhaps you would like to say something about how your first mathematical work, in the, perhaps in the Cambridge, I'm, I'm sure it started earlier, but uh, at Cambridge in the 1950s, it, it seemed to me that so much came out of that, and there are still some puzzles for you then which are still very much around now. Well, I started off by doing algebraic geometry in, in Cambridge as a graduate student at St. John's College. And uh, I think I, I was misled into thinking that algebraic geometry was geometrical. And I sh very soon learnt that it was basically algebra, uh, where geometry was the thing that I enjoyed and <coughs> found I could do m most easily. Uh, so one thing I did was to develop a notation which, well, Hodge was my supervisor originally, and uh, Michael Atiyah was one of the people, a contemporary of mine at the time, which was rather terrifying because I thought all graduate students were like that. And it took me a while to learn that there was something particular about Michael. But um, I, used to, I developed a notation, initially sort of to handle Hodge's lectures, because he gave lectures on differential geometry, and he had these indices all over the blackboard, and, and um, it was not the easiest, <coughs> his were not the easiest lectures to follow. And partly stimulated by that, I developed this notation where um, tensors could be represented with blobs with l arms and legs <coughs> and you could stick them together to form contractions and so on. So it converted uh, uh, algebraic problems to do with tensors into pictures which I could understand much more easily. Well, that's a whole motif which I was going to ask you about later, in fact, the number uh -huh. of ways in which you develop ways of seeing things on the page and in, in one's mind that's quite different from the usual way of uh, formal notation. But also it just strikes me that, I mean, you didn't follow the kind of algebraic geometry of the abs more abstract kind that's, that's been so e enormous since that period. There was, I mean, there were tremendous things going on with the abstraction of mathematics, yeah. but you, you kept to a geometric viewpoint, which must have been very unfashionable, really, in the Cambridge of that period. I think I was very unfashionable. Although, if you look at my thesis, there's not a single diagram in it. <laughs> but it was all done using... I mean, there were diagrams because I did the algebra by making these tensor pictures and drawing lines and having notations for symmetrizations and skew symmetrizations and things, and how you manipulated these things. And uh, <coughs> although it was very algebraic what I was doing. It was done in a very geometrical way. But I think this one of the big things that was important in how things developed with me was I developed this general formalism of tensors which went beyond the normal idea and that you could include things like negative dimensional tensors. And these turned out to have relevance to spin in quantum mechanics. Uh, but one of the things was I was very mystified by spinners because they seemed to be fractional things where you had a square root of a, a vector or something like that and I couldn't understand how, how you could do that. And uh, Dennis Sharma, who was a great friend of mine when I was in Cambridge, uh, quite early on he sort of uh, we got m made good friends and uh, <coughs> he was a cosmologist who was very much following the Cambridge line at that time, which was the, the steady state model of cosmology, because Bondi and Gold and Hoyle were all there, these being the originators of this idea, and Dennis was a strong follower of it, which I found very interesting and, and intriguing and philosophically, 
a satisfying picture where the universe sort of was there all the time. It didn't have a beginning and the expansion of the universe was compensated by a new material which was created continually, which uh, I had problems with later because it was hard to see how you could combine it with the rules of general relativity. And uh, uh, given the choice between general relativity and the steady state model, I would go with general relativity. Uh, but uh, my friendship with Dennis was very important to me because I learned a lot of physics from him. You see, I was doing pure mathematics as a graduate student, but there were at least three courses of lectures I went to. There were a lot of pure courses I went to which were important to me. I remember Philip Hall's courses. Sean, Sean Wiley gave a very nice course on topology and things like that. And, uh, but then I also went to other things which were not really evidently anything to do with what my research project was. One of these being a very beautifully done course by Bondi, Herman Bondi, on cosmology, general relativity and cosmology, which was done with great flair and, and a wonderful course. And another course, equally brilliant in a completely different way, was Dirac's course on quantum mechanics, which was, he was all, everything was very logical and, and very beautifully organized. Many of my colleagues said, oh, well, that's just the same as this book, you see. So I said, well, <laughs> I hadn't read his book. So the, the elegance of, the, of what he'd done came out in this lecture. But it was also important to me because for some reason, I don't know whether Dennis had been talking to him or something. I wasn't quite sure. But, but there was a, it was a course on standard quantum mechanics, which was the first term. And then the next term was to be on quantum field theory. And in this course, he took one week off to talk about two-component spinners. And uh, I had been trying to understand from reading various incomprehensible books about two-component spinners, and they made no sense to me at all. But these, I think it was probably two lectures Dirac gave, and they were just perfect. It became completely clear, the whole subject, which is a bit ironic because people think of Dirac as a four-component spinner man. But he, in fact understood, not only understood about two component spinners, but he developed his, the higher spin versions of his own equation using this formalism. And it seemed to me it was absolutely the right way to do it. So you've already mentioned, I mean, I, I'm thinking that when I was at Cambridge, it was very much divided, pure and applied, and people yes. hardly talked to each other at all. I mean, they, in my time, they were in separate departments, and you had, as an undergraduate, you were supposed to choose which you were, and you just stuck to it. There was a real cultural <laughs> yes. block there, but you just ignored that. Uh, that's my, I think I ignored it, yes. Well, well, Dennis was all the time trying to get me interested in, in physics. He, I had a conversation earlier before I went to Cambridge about the steady state. Wonderful lectures given by Fred Hoyle, which, which there were some issues which I couldn't quite uh, make sense of. And, and I got talking to Dennis, who was a friend of my brother's my brother Oliver, who was at Cambridge mm -hmm. a year, a couple of, well, several years before me. And um, so we struck up a friendship with, with Dennis at that point. So he was trying to get me to do physics all the time and get me interested in physics and maybe convert my subject to physics, which I never did because there were too many, I mean, there was too much in the mathematics that I was very much involved with and interested in. Tensor systems in, in general, uh, geometry ideas and so on. And a lot of these ideas which I should have learnt then, you see one of them in particular was uh, about sheaf cohomology mm -hmm. because, well they used to call them stacks in those days, theory of stacks you see. I think stacks still mean something but at that time it's what became what call, were called sheaves, sheaves I suppose. And I was baffled by the whole thing. And it was only many, many years later when, when Michael Atiyah made all these things clear. Uh, but at the time, I realized there were things that would have been very useful to me later on had I paid adequate attention then. What did, your, what did William Hodge think of your studying all these different <laughs> things? Did he, was he aware? I mean, I just think to many graduate students now, they'd be horrified by the idea of studying all the completely different courses and not 
uh, getting going on publishing the papers of the right number and the mm. right Maybe places. Maybe in a bit different then, yeah. but there yeah. was also a st slightly strange thing about... <laughs> <laughs> you see, I started off with Hodge and... Uh, uh, well, there were two other students. One of them gave up quite early. Another one was Michael Hoskin, who went through and did his PhD, but then went into history of science. And the other one was Michael Atiyah. Mm. And uh, as I say, I thought, you know, that they were all like that, more or less. <laughs> and it was quite, because Hodge suggested at one point, well, if I, he sensed I was a little unhappy with the very algebraic problem that he'd set me. And uh, <coughs> so he said, well, you might like, might like to sit in in one of the classes of another student. So that was... I didn't understand a single word of what was going on, but that was Michael, <laughs> Michael Atiyah, you see. And uh, I later became very good friends with him. There was another course that I went to when I was at Cambridge at the same sort of time as when I went to Dirac's and Bondi's course. This was a course by a, a, a logician called Steen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to that, which I also found it was very influential on what happened to me later on because I learned about Gödel's theorem. I'd vaguely heard about it before and I found it rather disturbing. You see, I think I would have, prior to going to Cambridge, believed, you know, we're all computers and that's what thinking is, is computation or something, and mainly because I couldn't think of anything else. Uh, and Gödel's theorem I'd vaguely heard of and it was sort of touted to something which was, uh, showed there were things in mathematics that you couldn't prove. And then when I went to the Steens course, it made quite clear that although you couldn't prove them using some particular system, the mere fact that you trusted that system is th something you could give, give reliable, derive reliable conclusions from, that mere belief in the system enabled you to transcend the system and you could find statements which had to be true on the basis of your trust in the system, even though the... Uh, you couldn't prove it using the system. So I found that very striking. Did you even at that time have some inkling that there should be some connection with the physical description of the brain and of matter generally? I think I did, but it wasn't very well formulated. You see, I think I probably did, as a result of Steen's course, come to the view, because I learned about Turing machines as well, that was all part of the course, so Turing machines and Gödel's theorem. And the fact, therefore, because of this understanding that seems to transcend any particular formal system that uh, there must be something else going on in the brain which is not of a computational character. And I probably learnt from Dirac's course on quantum mechanics. There again is a bit of an irony because I remember the first lecture I went to, he had this little piece of chalk, I think he broke the piece of chalk in two or something. He was talking about superpositions you know, in quantum mechanics. Well, you, if you could do one thing or another then you could have superpositions of the two. And so he said, you could have a superposition of a piece of chalk over here and over here. And my mind wandered at that point, you see. And he, I remember him saying something about energy or something, but, but I couldn't understand why this was an explanation of anything. And I thought it must be because my mind had wandered at that point that I'd missed the point. <laughs> but it worried me ever since. And uh, I think I did formulate the idea that there was a big gap in our understanding of the world in quantum mechanics specifically, and that there probably was some link between that and, and what must be going on in our conscious thinking. But it was pretty vague, and it was only very much later when I heard in a radio talk when Marvin Minsky and Edward mm. Fredkin were mm. talking from a very computationalist point of view, and I could see, well, from that perspective, then you I see why they're taking that view, but it seemed to me ridiculous to extrapolate to that degree. And this was what made me realize that, that I had something to say on this subject, which seemed to be different from what other people had been saying. So I had, had the idea that in the very remote future, I would write some book about trying to get people excited about mathematics and physics, but it didn't really have a focus. But then this thing said, oh, well, I shall try and describe my ideas about what's going on in the mind. I suppose we should, just in case people may not be so familiar with the time scale what we're talking about, because this really only 
what you're talking about now was the work which came out in The Emperor's New Mind. Yes, I've leapt ahead, yes. And, uh, <laughs> in, in, and in fact, you started publishing on this in the mid-80s, and the book was what? Uh, that was in, probably in the, in the 80s, wasn't yes. it? Yes. yes and right. perhaps we should just remind people that the cosmological picture, as you were studying it from Dennis Sharma, I mean, it was hardly, hardly anything was known at all then, really. It was just the really comparatively local expansion of the neighbouring galaxies in, in Well, modern I think terms, people I guess, regarded a uh, cosmology as, as m just philosophy or something. Yes. I mean, th yeah. there was no reason to believe one thing or another. And it became... Well, it was the microwave background. That but that was only later. That was discovered. much later. So yeah, when you right. were introduced to it, it was Absolutely. a very... Mm. It was a... a not exactly a clean slate because yeah. the Hubble expansion was known, but nothing like the detail that's right. of today. I'm afraid I am jumping around here. <laughs> You're quite right. The, the but that's just interesting because you took up subjects which then would have been comparatively low profile. I mean, relativity as a subject was not... Uh, no. was not I mean, Herman Bondi put the new modern ideas into it. I think it, Bondi I was a big influence, yes. He yeah. gave some radio talks which yeah. were extremely good, very clear. And he, he certainly influenced me a lot. Yeah. And uh, put the subject... In, well, it was a very physical way I had of talking yes. about things, but it was extremely clear. I think I lot learned a lot also from other colleagues, Felix Pirani in particular, mm. was somebody who I learned a lot of the mathematics of relativity from. So I think that's where, we can, where you were able to put two of these otherwise completely disparate pieces of knowledge together, which is understanding of the null geometry and the spinner representation being relevant yes. to general relativity. Yes. Uh, how did that was, that was, that's something which came out of, the, out of geometry and relativity that... Yes, I have to I try and think of do. the order yeah. in which these yeah. things... I was certainly, I got interested in, in the physics. And you see, Dennis was very, he was, he knew everything that was going on in the world of physics particularly cosmology and astrophysics and that kind of thing. But he also was interested in the foundations. And uh, he, we used to, he used to drive, we sometimes we'd go to Stratford and go to plays, you see. Mm -hmm. And he would drive in his fancy car, you see, at great speed. And as you went round <laughs> the, the corners at this great speed, he would say, now that's the action of the fixed stars, you see. Oh. Because he had this yes, yes. Marx principle idea yes. was very strong with him, that somehow what determined the local inertia was the distant stars and the galaxies with this sort of Marxian idea. And, and if you were rota the rotate Newton's rotating bucket, you see, it's the, the reason it bulges at the edges because the influence of the stars is sort of pulling it around, you see. And we used to have these discussions as we would drive to or from um, Stratford. And the idea would be, well, suppose the stars or the galaxies we got rid of them one by one, they all, what would happen to inertia, you see? Mm -hmm. And so I tended to take this to an extreme. So well, you, there's nothing left but the car, you see. Well, then would you feel anything, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that you, you just the inertia would be, according to this view, fixed by the car itself. So I'd go down and say, well, look, suppose you just had two electrons, mm -hmm. you see then how do they mm -hmm. know how they're spinning? Or one electron, you see. Well, one electron, does it know which way it's spinning? Or if you have two, or if you have several. And so I started thinking about individual spin systems where you had no notion of direction. It was only what the total spin was when they came together, and you bring another one in, does the spin go up or down? What are the rules, you see? And so I developed this idea of spin networks from basically from that idea. I hadn't realized that the spin networks were as early as that and therefore yes. related to your, uh, well, the, to the negative dimensional tensor and yes. the diagram calculus that you'd worked out. That's right, that all, that all came in, yeah, that right, all that came very in early. very early, yes. And then you see the connection also between the dimensionality. See, this mm. was a thing that intrigued me very much, mm. was how you have with spin, Spin, you take an electron, a spin half particle, then it's, it's only got two ways it can spin, you see. But how can you have two ways when it's got the whole sphere of directions? Well, that's because of quantum mechanics and spin up and spin down and all the other spins are combinations of them. And then you see the array of the complex combinations of two states, which is really a sphere. And that sphere gives you the directions in space. Well, there you have an intimate relationship between the three-dimensionality of space, 
and the complex numbers of quantum mechanics. And so this kind of struck me as something deep in a way. And then also when I started thinking more about the, I, I can't quite think of the order of this, mm. but the relativity picture, where you now have the, the light cone and you have the directions along the light cone, or if you like the sky, celestial sphere, and you have the different directions on the different points on the sphere. And then again, it becomes useful to represent those as points on the, the Riemann sphere, the complex plane together with infinity. And that sphere is physically a very natural way of thinking about the directions <laughs> in space. Yeah, you see and it this, all the time. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You go out on dark night and you see... Well, we see the past anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you see a, few, yeah. a little bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, out in space, of course, you have a, a better picture. But somehow, the thinking of that as, a, as, a, as, as the complex sphere uh, was a very crucial way of and, and nailing down the space-time dimensionality, three space and one time, and only then do you get a light cone, which is uh, a complex structure. Complex so you had form. Dirac's two spinners, which is completely contrary to most... Yeah, most, yeah. I mean, what one pe people would think, that he was wedded to the force force yes, yes. spinner and the gammas and everything and yet that gave you insight from from quantum mechanics into space-time and relativity yep. which is again not the direction one would naturally think of no but, uh, I, I yeah. just went yeah. I tended to go my own way I think I'd, I mean I was always you see when I was at school I remember particularly in Canada I was in Canada mm. during the war years and uh, I was extremely slow and you need my mathematics papers. I wouldn't get very good marks. And one, in fact, once I got moved down a class because I was very bad at doing mental arithmetic. But there was a teacher, we had a very insightful teacher, Mr. Stinnett, I think he was called. And he realized that if I was given enough time, I might do rather well in the tests, you see. So he said, all right, we're going to have a test today. It's the whole, uh, usually we, it's just this, this, uh, this period, and you're supposed to finish this, but I'm going to let you have any, as long as you like. So I would be working away, the next period would be a play period, and people would be outside enjoying themselves, I'd be still plugging away. Occasionally I'd go on into the one after that, still working away at this test. And then I would do very well, I would get, you know, 98% or something, on, and it was a huge difference. And I think the thing was, that I was not good at remembering things, you see, you know, if I could my tables, or whatever it happened to be. But if I had enough information so I could work it out each time, <laughs> you see. So I think I, it was something I always tried to work these things out for myself. Of course, that's not much good if you're trying to do a school exam. <laughs> but uh, later on, it kind of served, served its purpose. So I had to think these through, these things on my own terms, <coughs> rather than learning about them from a book or whatever it was. So I would guess that if you put forward these... Uh, I mean, the particle physicists of that period wouldn't have been very interested in, in whether it's in two spinners or, <laughs> no, or no, the no. relationship of SL2C to the no. <laughs> uh, and this kind of thing. But, and that, your direction went into, into, into relativity, but really you had a great deal that was coming from quantum mechanics as yes. well as from classical geometry That's in the background. True. Is that... Is that, is that Quantum mechanics certainly was was a big influence on me. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know exactly when I firmly thought, well, something's got to be done done about yeah. quantum mechanics, that you have to change the rules at some level. I think I felt that pretty early, but I couldn't put a, a date to that. But nevertheless, the idea that that quantum features um, very fundamentally at the level of small things, um, yes, that was a crucial. Uh, what and what point also is just understanding the importance of null coordinates and the light rate and the conformal yes, structure yes. and, and that the metric is secondary and your observation on the, the moving sphere um, yes. in 1959 was it's just such a, I mean, just a two-page <laughs> yes. working out of that idea but yeah, it yeah. destroys a whole lot of talk about people being squashed up when they move in uh, relativity. <laughs> yes. uh, yes. did, was that, uh, I and mean, that was I'm well, that was not sure where that rank yeah. comes in your publications, but fairly, it's... Uh, it was before, I, you see, I went to America. This was probably in 
I went to America in 59, I guess mm. it was. In 1958, I went to the, a conference on general relativity and gravitation in, in Royaumont, near Paris. And uh, that was shortly after I'd been thinking about spinners in relativity. Um, yeah, I, well, Dennis, Dennis Sharma again, you see, he was very keen uh, on getting people together who he thought might have something to say to each other. And I think, am I right, in 55 was the first general relativity conference, uh, and 58 must have been the second, is that? I mean, it was very early days. Yes, it wasn't relativity. the first. The first right? one was probably Chapel Hill. I can't remember. There were, there were two, and I can't remember which was called the first one. I see. Chapel Hill was one, and Paris was the second. But it would have been a comparatively small body of people. Relatively speaking, but there were a lot of people I got to know well and uh -huh. knew them later on. Yeah, Ted Newman. Uh, lots of people. It was a big influence on me, but it was important to me because, well, I just, let me just backtrack a little bit. It would have been 57, probably. I'm not quite sure the date. But Dennis persuaded me to go down to L King's College London, where David Finkelstein was giving a talk about the Schwarzschild solution and getting rid of the singularity or something. So, oh, that sounds interesting. I wasn't working on general relativity really then. You see, I was thinking about these spinners and so on. And uh, he gave a talk where he showed how you could extend the Schwarzschild solution to within the horizon, what we now call the horizon, yeah. but people used to think of the Schwarzschild singularity. And uh, he did it in one past and the future and then showed how to stick these together into what was now called the classical uh, extension. And this made a big impression on me. But it was kind of curious because Finkelstein at that time was his main interest was general relativity, and mine was in spinners and playing around mm. with things in the small and quantum mechanics and so on. And we, in a certain sense, were combinatorial. I was doing spin yeah, networks. Yeah, and so I explained yeah. to him about spin networks. And he, from then on, went on and did combinatorial things, and I picked up and did general relativity after that. So we sort of swapped roles. But I can see how that would have touched all sorts of things. It needs the null coordinates to, to do that. Uh, well, it was, it was, you see, there, there was... The history of it was sort of like this. I went to the lecture, and I was very impressed by how you got rid of this so-called Schwarzschild singularity, but you still had the singularity in the middle. Yes. So I thought somehow okay, you've pushed it from one place, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. So I began to think, is there a, a general argument to show yeah. that singularities have to be there? Now, I had no mechanism, no, nothing to try and tackle this problem. The only thing I, I had, which I'd been studying, were the spinners. So I thought, well, look, let me just see how spinners work to try and describe relativity. So then I, I did that, and I looked at the viral thing, and, and it all kind of came out so beautifully. And the viral curvature being totally symmetric spinner and all this stuff was... was uh, and no one else had done that. But Felix Pirani did things. Was that... It, that, was, it, was, that was, it was Lou Whitten. Ed uh -huh. Whitten's father, right. who had, I didn't know about it. Uh -huh. Felix Pirani mentioned there was this paper by Lou Whitten where he had actually applied spinners and looked at the invariants. There were some things which weren't quite right in the paper. Um, I, I sort of looked at it and corrected that and, and, and did some other things that he hadn't, he hadn't done, like the canonical representation into four principal null directions and so on. And all that stuff. But somehow it all fitted together in a much more beautiful way than I had thought. And it was as much that as, as David Finkelstein's lecture, I think, which dragged me into, into studying general relativity in a serious way. I'd been interested in it before that. My first interest, curiously enough, my first encounter with general relativity, apart from my brother Oliver vaguely describing it to me, was a little book by Schrodinger, mm -hmm. Space-Time Structure which is a really nice little book, <laughs> apart from the last chapter where he goes on to his own funny ideas. But most of it was a very beautiful ex explanation of the tensor calculus and so on. So I learned about that even before I went to Cambridge. But then uh, picking up things from Felix Pirani and, and Dennis and, and so I... And then I went to the Royalmont Conference, which was in 58. Yes, that's 58, what it was. I think. And Dennis very generously, he was, one of the, he was one of the principal speakers at this meeting. He said, well, look, I've got an hour's talk given to me. I'll let you have half my time. I thought that was extremely generous of him. 
So I gave my little talk on the, on the spinners. I forget whether it was an hour and a half a time, whether it was 40, 40 minutes and I had 20 minutes, I can't remember. So it was a rather hurried little talk on showing how you disc translate these tensor quantities into spinners and how beautifully it fit in with, with the ideas of general relativity. That was actually motivated by what became the singularity theorems in yes. the mid 60s. But That's that was right. before you'd actually, I mean, this was, anyway, it was before we really started on, on uh, publishing. Yes, work, there were certain, certain yeah, well, I published no. the thing on the, on the spinners, yes. which is 1960. But then um, it was more, you, you, I went to Princeton, I was in two years, well, a year and a half in Princeton and Syracuse. Uh, and I got influenced by John Wheeler, I think, on the idea that you have, or it may have been a little after that. Yes, I think it was that the, there was a conference in Warsaw where I, that's where I started talking about conformal infinity. And I think then, um, in the, in the mid sixties, early sixties, um, it became clear from the observations by Martin Schmidt that there were, these were the first observations of quasars. And I remember Wheeler getting very excited about this and saying, look, this tells us there are objects which are really down to the scale of their Schwarzschild singularity. Before, we always used to think, oh, well, this Schwarzschild so-called singularity, this tiny little thing would be, wouldn't have any real relevance to physics whatsoever. But here, it became clear that there was something funny was going on where you really had things which varied they, were, they must be sufficiently big because they're this energetic and they must be sufficiently small because they varied within weeks or days or weeks or something, so they can't be too big and therefore they must be of their sort of size of that their Schwarzschild radius was. That was what we now call a black hole. And uh, the name black hole hadn't emerged at that stage. But Wheeler was very interested in this idea about whether singularities were generic or not. Were you aware of the, uh, I mean, uh, you were aware of Oppenheimer's 1939? Yes, yes. well, this was man, something yeah. that Wheeler very, made a big point. Yes, he would have known about. all about it. Yes. Yes. So the, the various yeah. papers that Oppenheimer was involved in, yeah. and particularly the Oppenheimer-Snyder paper, yes. where you, just before the war, where you had this collapse of a very artificial material, yes. sort of dust, and very artificial, and it was exactly symmetrical. And, and then he had this model of it collapsing to a point. But it was regarded by many people as highly artificial. These idealizations wouldn't apply generally, particularly because the Russians, these were Lyshet and Kalatnikov, mm. seemed to have proved that the singularities were a very special thing and they would not occur generally. Now, I'd sort of seen a little bit about their proof and I couldn't imagine you could really prove something like this the way they were doing it. So I started trying to think about this in, in other ways, geometrically, kind of visualizing what it would be like in, inside a collapsing star and trying to, uh, convincing myself it had to be a non-local argument, that you wouldn't be able to prove anything from purely local considerations. And then there was this idea about what's called a trapped surface, which came about in a rather curious way. Oh, so well, I was talking to, yeah. Yeah, Ivo Robinson. I, I was at, uh, at that time, I was in Birkbeck College in London, and Ivo Robinson, who was a friend of mine, I learned a lot of things about spinners and self dual things and so on, which became important later in twister theory. And uh, he was talking about something completely different, politics probably. <laughs> and, uh, and we came to a street, and across the street, and the conversation stopped then. And then we got to the other side, he started talking again, you see. And then when he, he, went, he went, on, went home, you see, went where he was going. And I remember thinking at the end of this, a feeling of elation. And I couldn't pinpoint it. Now, why am I feeling like this? You see, so I went back to all the things I'd been thinking of during the day. And then I remembered crossing the street. And when I was halfway across the street, a thought occurred to me. And this was evidently this characterization of, of a collapse, what we call a trapped surface that this characterization, which was a global condition, and it would tells you that this star has reached a point of no return. And so when that, I realized that idea, I then developed a pretty well the same day, rough, roughed out a proof that you had to get singularities. 
But the, uh, that's misleading in the sense that the techniques were things that I had developed a bit earlier. Partly, although never published, as an argument going back to the steady state model, because oh, I was yeah. interested in steady state, but I also interested in general relativity. And I was trying to see, is it possible that you could have something like steady state consistent with general relativity? If it was an exactly symmetrical case, you could see there'd be problems with energy. But if it's irregular, maybe you'll get away with it. But then I developed an argument with these cones and focusing and so on to realize that that wouldn't help, that you'd still be in trouble. I never published that. But there was an argument in the, the which was another thing in the Royal Society I had to try and prove something about asymptotics, which I wasted a lot of time. But I developed these techniques. I thought I was wasting a lot of time. But I developed the techniques which became just what were needed in the case of the collapsing. So I see. So those ideas in differential geometry and topology, which you needed there, were developed for the problem of the 50s with yes. steady state, which was where she was blasted. I mean, as soon as the Big Bang was, uh, the, the radiation the microwave was, background. The, yeah, yeah. was yeah. discovered, yeah. it was really out, <laughs> of the, out of the picture. Yes. But yeah. it turned out just the thing for black holes, which were a fantasy in the, in the 50s. Yeah. But uh, yeah. oh, well, very far from fantasy now. I mean, it, 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 that's right. Well, it was curious how the how the thing developed because the, the first I went to, to a lot of the early what are called the Texas conferences mm. on relativistic astrophysics, and I went to the first one, which was a lot of the stuff about the the quasars, these mm -hmm. these uh, things that Mar Martin Schmidt had seen and Wheeler was very excited about, and so on, and uh, and Roy Kerr at that point had found the, the solution known as the Kerr solution, which is, can be interpreted as a rotating black hole. It wasn't totally clear at that stage that you could interpret it that way, but um, this did become clear. And knowledge of these things was important in, in what I did at that stage. The, to show that you had to get singularities under extremely general circumstances. No, no symmetry assumed. No particular equations of state. You didn't have to assume the dust that, that Oppenheimer and Schneider had. You could have a quite general material as long as you didn't violate energy, energy positivity. So the obvious thing in the late 60s was to go completely into the new realm of general relativity <laughs> that's opened up by modern astronomy and cosmology. And what did you do? You started thinking about elementary particle physics. Well, twist the theory. <laughs> but it was going along at the same yes, time, yes. yes. <laughs> yes, it was. Well, yeah, they were definitely at the same time. But you see, these were things that were nagging at me for a long time. I just couldn't... I have to give Engelbert Schucking a lot of credit mm. here because on my earlier trip to the... This is the first trip to the States where I, I went after... To, first to work with John Wheeler in Princeton and then I went to Syracuse and I shared an office with Engelbert Schucking. And he kept on talking about conformal mm. maps and the importance of conformal transformations mm. and how Maxwell's equations were mm. invariant. And for what reason, I wasn't sure at mm. that time. But another thing he stressed was the importance in quantum field theory of the notion of positive frequency. And these things stuck with me. And they were very important in the development of twister theory. Partly the conformal stuff to, to represent radiation by squashing infinity down, making a conformal boundary to space-time. That, that was one of the ideas. But the idea of the positive frequency was very crucial to Twisted Theory. I remember I made a... I knew I wanted some kind of geometry which was complex in some fundamental way, but was really trying to describe the world as we know it as well and had to try and bring quantum theory in. And I made a huge table with all sorts of topics and arrows going between them and things like this. <laughs> and, and, uh, but the Engelbert thing about the positive frequency, which nobody in, in quantum field theory tended to stress that at that time. It was not... I think they think of it like physicists, physicists generally do in terms of yeah. Fourier, Fourier analysis. Yes. So then it's sort of trivial, it's just plus and minus. I think it was the combination, and yes, of the Fourier analysis and the fact that if conformal things were important, Fourier analysis is not appropriate because yes, it's not so conformally yeah. variant. 
nevertheless, the fact that you're choosing positive frequency as opposed to negative is conformally invariant. And this idea of extending, so you have your Riemann sphere again, you've got your function on the equator, a real valued function, that's the real numbers on the equator. And then if you can extend your function into the holomorphically into the north or the south, this gives you positive and negative frequency. Now, well, that's a, such a beautiful idea. Can that be extended in some global way to the whole of space-time? And this was nagging me, you see. And I wanted something where, you see, if you complexify, you, you don't have splitting into two halves. You see, this Riemann sphere, you complexify the circle, you've got the Riemann sphere. That's the real part splits it into two halves, and so you get the positive and the negative frequencies. Well, maybe I think it's negative and positive, but never mind. And so I kept thinking, well, what about Minkowski space? Well, if you complexify, it doesn't split anything into two halves, you see. <laughs> but then I remember being driven, from, I think it was shortly after the Kennedy assassination. I was in America, you see, in, in, da in, in, um, in Austin, Texas. And the families, respective families, this was the Rindlers and Oshvats, had gone down to uh, San Antonio. I can't remember where it was exactly. And in the car back, I was, Pish Dashvart was driving me, and he's not very talkative, so there's a lot of silence, you see. And I began thinking about this thing that Ivor Robinson had about how you can take a, uh, a light ray and somehow push it into the complex, and then you get these funny solutions of the Maxwell equations, which are non-singular and twisting. And so I tried to understand what was going on. And then I realized that these things about the Clifford parallels, I can't quite remember the... I realized that, the, yes, that the, the solutions of the Maxwell equations must have their null directions along these Clifford parallels. But I vaguely knew, I knew about the Clifford parallels already. But the fact that this is what you got, I, I realized this must be what you got, this configuration. So the, the twisting of the lines around these... Tor in, nested tori, uh, that configuration which I'd sort of known about from the Clifford parallels. But when I got home, I just translated it all into two component spinners and it kind of dropped out and that was twister, twister theory. And, and then you see you had the two, the thing was split into two halves automatically. You had the, the real, the space of the light rays and then it's a sort of mild complexification into these two halves, the right-handed ones and the left-handed ones. And that this was the analog of the splitting of the Riemann sphere into two halves. It took a long time before realizing how it really was mm. that. <laughs> so it was because it needed the cohomology. But it's so striking. I mean, now the, the Twister variables are used by physicists, but they seem to call it a half Fourier transform and you think of it in a completely linear way, really. Yeah, Nothing like this geometric characterization. And yet, if, if we're going to get away from doing everything in Minkowski space, we really need to have some picture yeah. of what a particle is, an antiparticle is, and so on, yeah. which doesn't depend on... I mean, I don't know if you... We may be coming on to this, really. Is there, yeah. there are things of that period which you worried about, which I think are still very open Well, it's, it's very <laughs> interesting. I mean, it, and as you know, <laughs> <laughs> we had this group developing <laughs> ideas of twister theory and these meetings um, every Friday pretty well and discussions fairly broad-ranging broad discussions on various topics. And then you, almost single-handedly, developed these ideas of twisted diagrams. And, and, uh, uh, and I w always admired you, how much you, you, know, you, you felt this was a thing to do, and you stuck with it. Uh, well, they were your diagrams, <laughs> but I kept them alive until you they kept could it could wasn't combine with other people's you uh, developed discoveries them in, ways in a which different, I had different a, way. I hadn't conceived of but, at all. Uh, I'm yes. just thinking we... I suppose I'm thinking is this. You've always worried about what a wave function really, really is. Yes. And a lot of people don't worry about this. They just <laughs> write down the formalism of quantum mechanics and yeah. linear and so forth. But do you like things that we can see, in a sense? I mean, I think yeah. seeing is... It's very important to I all you do, whether true. it's the notation yeah, yeah, yeah. or just the business of light or yeah. the action of consciousness and seeing the truth of, of a Gödel statement. I mean, this is something that's very important. I and I feel you yeah. don't think we, we can see what a wave function is. is, that, is that, would that be a But I always worried about people saying, oh, well, quantum mechanics just yeah. tell us pictures are no yeah. use anymore, sort of thing. Yeah. See. Just calculate, the, yeah. forget about the pictures. But I never was happy with that. I always wanted to try and picture anything I could. 
certainly with spin, ideas with spin and so on, which were, seemed to be very important to develop the geometrical ideas as far as one could. But there are certain very odd things about quantum mechanics. Well, I think, as I wrote in one of my books, that Shadows of the Mind, they, they're Quantum mechanics has two kinds of mysteries. I think people tend to confuse them. Mm -hmm. So the ones I call the, the Z mysteries, which are the puzzle mysteries, uh, which are things which are true of the world and baffling, but you can understand them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, it's not quite the way we used to think the world was like. Uh, spin doesn't behave like a little yeah. cricket ball or something spinning around a well-defined axis. There's something much more subtle going on. But it can be understood, and it's consistent, and it makes sense. It makes beautiful sense often. And there are the, the X mysteries. X ones were the ones which were paradoxes and the Schrodinger's cat. So you have quantum mechanics tells you, without a very difficult experiment, although not so nice on the cat, you can put it into a superposition of being dead and alive. And so Schrodinger was basically showing, well, look, this is what my Schrodinger, mm -hmm. Schrodinger's equation is telling you you could have. as a cat which is dead and alive at the same time. That's nonsense. <laughs> you don't see cats like that. So although he never quite put it like that, it seemed to me he was saying, look, there's something missing. There's something in the theory which is not adequate. And uh, Einstein felt the same way. And Dirac, surprisingly. Oh, enough, yes, that's felt Dirac the same uh, in that, because that's one reason yes. I've, I was interested to hear about it. He was very Dirac quiet about it. Yeah. He got more, you can see on the, on the, on the web, there are some lectures yeah. there where he explicitly says this. And I, 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 I have trouble finding the original quotes, because I, I know there are some quotes where he quite clearly says that, that the theory is, is not. Well, yes, it says in the, in the Bohr-Einstein debates, he says, well, you know, Bohr is normally thought of to have won these, but mm -hmm. I think maybe time will tell that Einstein mm. perhaps mm. Um, had more of the right idea. Did you get that skepticism from him? Uh, no. No, way. no, that wasn't a feature of what he was He was talking very about. reluctant, I think, mm -hmm. to express his inner opinions. Mm -hmm. you, very hard. Mm -hmm. I had a curious experience once. I was asked by the philosophy department at Boston University. You see, the philosophers like to have you know, a talk given by somebody, and then there will be somebody to contradict him yeah, or something, you see. So he, they asked me if I'd like if do this, you see. Who was I supposed to contradict? Well, they actually, they'd heard about Dirac and <laughs> commented <laughs> it about how projective geometry had been useful in his thinking, you see. So they had him, and, and rashly, I said, oh, well, okay, I'll make some comments. But you can't, you can't refute that, because that's I an obvious idea. I couldn't, yeah. yes, that's <laughs> absolutely, yes. So he yes. gave this talk, you see, Dirac gave this talk. And it was a very elegantly yeah. put Dirachian uh, talk on projective geometry. Yeah. Just on projected geometry, no physics, no, re no influence on his own thinking or anything. It was just a talk on projective geometry. So I'm afraid I slightly made, well, I think some of the audience were hoping you might reveal <laughs> some of your <laughs> inner thinking. <laughs> and then I gave a little talk, since I took a leaf out of his book and gave a little talk on twister theory, <laughs> oh, okay. which yeah. is now my version of projective yeah. geometry in physics. Yeah. But that was slightly curious. But, um, but projective geometry had a big influence on me, of course. Oh, actually, actually, that's backtracking a bit, but, but that really would have seemed an old-fashioned subject in, the, yes. in your time. It's something that Victorian, yes. I mean, that people just dropped out of the syllabus by that time, I think. Or oh, just a little Almost. unit here and I there. I just caught I it. You yes. see, yeah. we, I went to, when I was at University College London, that's where I did my undergraduate yeah. work, there was, uh, in fact, geometry was quite a big part of the, the syllabus. You had applied mathematics, you had sort of algebra, no, you applied mathematics, analysis, and then algebra and geometry. I think it was like that. Mm -hmm. But the geometry was a significant part of that. And there was a, a, an old guy called Wren, T.L. Wren, who was a very great purist. He started off, you know, there were just two axioms, you know, any, there's a line through any two points. And if there's a line through these two points and through these and it meets there, then these two meet here. <laughs> you, how much could you prove from that, you see? Mm -hmm. Occasionally you needed another axiom a bit later on, but, but I kind of like, no, everybody else hated it, but I rather liked oh, it, of course, yeah. you see. I, I thought it was very nice to see these kind of very primitive ideas developing into, into geometry. So there was some projective geometry which I learnt there, which was quite important mm -hmm. in my own understandings. Uh, now what was I going to say here? <laughs> 
Well, you brought it back in Dirac's yeah. context. Yes. Um, and I was just thinking that it did come from your earlier experience. In a way, it was quite unusual. I, yes. I, I think. So it was just, I caught the tail end of it. Well, yeah. I think there was an... The, the, uh, um, there was another geometer who came in after, but then it kind of faded away and mm. got almost removed from the syllabus yes. completely. And then it swung back a bit. Yeah. But, but it was considered to be unfashionable. And even when you did what was called algebraic geometry, there was very little geometry in the sense of <laughs> what you could actually see yes. Yes. in it. So I didn't take to that too well, although I you know, tried to put as much in as I could. But a lot of it was translated out when I translated my diagrams into, into some incomprehensible notation which is, I'm afraid, what my thesis end, uh, ended up as. But uh, the geometry was always important to me, but it sort of went more into the physics, like geometry of quantum mechanics and uh, relativity, general relativity, and that sort of thing. Well, Roger, we've talked about how in the early days you started thinking about cosmology when people really knew absolutely nothing about <laughs> cosmology at all. There was hardly anything about the stars that people would see. Now it's completely different. There's absolutely, absolutely gigantic amounts of data yep. and huge numbers of people pouring over them in every way. Uh, how, but you, I think, would feel that some quite fundamental things haven't really been answered at all. I mean, the role of the cosmological constant and then the origin of the... Uh, well, yes. tell me how you think <laughs> things stand at the moment. Well, I do. I suppose I must think about things somewhat differently because the problems that I've regarded as important over the years attain scant attention these days. Well, I've always been very puzzled by the second law of thermodynamics and the, and the direction of time and all that. And whether well, various things it has to do with, which maybe are offshoots in one way or another, like our unconscious perception relates to it, but let's leave that aside for the moment. The main thing, which is a pretty obvious thing in a way, but which is almost totally ignored. Now, you see, we're supposed to have this Big Bang origin of the universe. And it, if entropy, which is this measure of disorder, is increasing with time, which is what the second law tells us, that means, well, okay, it's understandable if I have a glass of water and I splash it, it goes on the ground and you don't see the opposite. That's entropy increasing, you don't see the entropy decreasing. But if you state this the other way around, it's the same statement, but just phrased in the opposite direction, it means as you go back in time, things get more and more and more ordered. Entropy goes down and down and down. And where do you get? Well, you get to this thing called the Big Bang. And what's the best piece of evidence for the Big Bang? Well, it's this microwave background. You see this radiation coming from all directions. And this microwave background has one very important characteristic feature, as noticed very early on by the COBE uh, mission, that you see thermal equilibrium. You see this beautiful spectrum, the Planck spectrum, which indicates that what you're looking at was in thermal equilibrium. Well, it's not equilibrium really because it was expanding, but taking that into account, that expansion is not an entropy increasing expansion, it's adiabatic expansion. And Tolman, the American cosmologist and physicist, fully appreciated that, that you were looking at something which was in effect thermal equilibrium. Now that is, on the face of it, a paradox, because surely, when you go back in time, if the entropy is going down and down and down, it ought to be pretty small. Yet what you see is something telling you the entropy was at its maximum. Now, it's never been said, as, you know, this is a great puzzle. Who says that? Well, I've been saying it, but <laughs> <laughs> hardly anybody else. Not only that, that they don't say that, but they say this is what you expect. In the standard cosmological models, if you take a completely random initial state, you, that's what you get, and that's what you expect. And yeah, sure. And that, you know, when they saw, when Penzias and Wilson saw this thing, um, Dickey and people would say, well, yeah, well, that's what we expected to see. <laughs> um, it's just the flash of the Big Bang you're seeing. Well, what about the entropy? How can that be 
Well, the, 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 I think there's a sort of irony here, because people tried to solve the Einstein equations for cosmology, and how do you solve them? Well, you assume symmetry, because otherwise the equations are just too hard to solve. And Friedman did this. He just assumed you have a very homogeneous isotropic universe, and now he was able to solve the equations. Einstein was rather unhappy with his equations <laughs> initially, but nevertheless, he did it right. Einstein agreed with his mathematics, but he thought, he thought there must be something wrong somewhere. But it's curious that, that it's these models which have been what people have used ever since. And since they use them, it's just, they think this is cosmology. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this is such an incredible assumption, mm -hmm. it doesn't sort of hit people. And this is where the entropy is low. It's because all the ripples in the space-time that could have been there weren't there. And they were initially assumed not to be there because it's the only way they could solve the equations. But then you get used to the idea they're not there because those are the models. But why weren't they there? All these degrees of freedoms in the gravitational free field could have been there. And to see how extraordinary this uh, assumption is, you think of a collapsing universe, which has all the ir irregularities which might be there, forms black holes, these black holes congeal, the entropy goes soaring up incredibly. Now that we have this Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy in a black hole, we now can make an estimate for how big that entropy is and how improbable the universe that we actually find ourselves to be in. So I can see you might have had that, that puzzle even before the big um, and microwave background was discovered because yes. that was attracted you to the to the Hoyle steady state model as a way of getting out of the Friedman. It's uh, true that, that I that, thought about the. Yeah. You see, I did think about the second law issue very much in mm. connection with the the uh, the steady state model, but there, yeah, it it was something that I worried yeah. about. But then it seemed that the problem could be solved with the picture that they have, with the hydrogen being uniformly distributed, mm. and then as it plumps into stars, that gives you an increase in the energy. It's the, it's the right idea, because, but it's with the wrong model. You see, you have a model with the hydrogen produced uniformly, and as it clumps, it produces these hot spots. It's gra the action of gravity. Yeah. Gravity produces hot spots, and the sun is a hot spot in the dark sky, and it's not that the sun is, is hot, not the sun is bright, gives us our uh, life on the Earth, because if the so whole sky was the same temperature as the sun, it would be totally useless. It's the combination of the hot sun and the dark sky, and that's where the low entropy resides, and that comes about through gravity. So it was this crucial thing, which, yeah, already when that's I was thinking about steady state, I must have been thinking about that, although I can't quite pinpoint that. But that's true. I did, I did yes. worry about s second law then. But the fact that the hydrogen was... Did Dennis Sharma think about that at all? Because that's the sort of thing which... I don't remember that, particularly... Yeah. Yes, he yeah. should have. But, well, I wrote this article for the, the Hawking... No, for the, well, Hawking Israel were the editors, the Einstein centenary volume. Yeah. And um, this was... I put this long article about the study, about the second law of thermodynamics. Mm. I don't think I had discussed all those things with Dennis beforehand. But, but I didn't have the particular idea that I had subsequently then. Yes, yes. yes yeah. I didn't know how to characterize the particular way in which the Big Bang was special. And that really comes out of studying the conformal structure. I mean, that's, that's one thing. That's yes, that you, you, yes. You, in the earlier days, you wouldn't have I think attached I had, as much yes. importance to as you, as you yes. would subsequently. Is it? Well, there were a number of things I noticed very early on, which played very important roles later on, but I couldn't figure out early. See, one of them is this fact, just, just a curious fact in mathematics. We're talking about four dimensions and we're talking about space-time, four, one time, three space, and we're talking about the vial curvature. Now, the vial curvature is a conformal curvature, so if you have a metric, you don't know what the scale of things is, but you know what angles are, or if you know what the light cones are, that's another way of saying the same thing. That conformal structure tells you where the light cones are, but you don't know big from small. Then the characterization of the curvature is in this vial curvature, W-E-Y-L. Um, and the vial curvature is a measure of the conformal curvature. But it's also, in a sense, a measure of the gravitational degrees of freedom. Mm 
Now, in connection with twisters, but not specifically twisters, I think I was thinking about it before that, because I was looking at how you write in spinners the zero rest mass field equations for all the different spins. It was basically Dirac, and though I had it, although when he did the zero mass case, for some reason he did it a different way, which I never fully understood. Mm -hmm. But if you followed up Dirac's earlier paper and did it for zero mass, that's what you get. You have this particular way of writing the, the different spins. And the Maxwell equations, you've just got two indices, and then you the, the graviton equation, if you like, you've got four indices. It's just the same equation. Neutrino equation is just one, if you consider it massless. And so the, the gravitational field is to propagate, and there's this wave equation. I had this interesting, talking about slightly anecdotal things. Dirac never talked much, but I was a fellow at St. John's College at the same time as Dirac, and I remember at one point asking him whether I could have a chat with him about some of his stuff, you see, because I knew he was interested in quantizing general relativity. And so he, he agreed, and so he went off and had this, and I started describing this spinner stuff to him. And I had this equation, this wave equation for the, for the, for the uh, spin two field, you see. And I said, I wondered if this might have anything to do with quantization. You Using see. the two spinners which he had introduced. Which he did, he introduced, introduced you, yes, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, he introduced, yeah. Well, he didn't introduce the idea. Well, no, no, but he yeah, introduced to, me, to you. Yeah. Absolutely, that's right. And so he, sa well, he said, I, why, is this any use of quantization? Well, I don't know. You have to have a Hamiltonian with this company. So. Mm. So I was slightly, but then the other thing, yes, the other thing about this equation, he said, well, where does that, he said to me, where does that equation come from? I said, well, it comes from the Bianchi identities. And he said, what are the Bianchi identities? And I thought, what? Uh, you don't know what the Bianchi, you see, yeah. and here he'd been doing all these quantizations. Well, you see, he obviously knew them, he just didn't know they were called the Bianchi oh, identities. He knew the, contract, he, yeah. the contracted ones, because of all, and it was curious that, I mean, I guess he, he, somebody who worked very much on his own too. So he knew all these equations, yeah. but he had no idea that they, those were called the Bianchi identities. That's a slight um, odd extra story. But the point was, this came later, but the realization that you had this propagation equation which made the, the gravitational equations look just like Maxwell equations, but for spin two rather than spin one. I mean, this was done already by Pauli and Fiertz or something, but they didn't do it this way. They did it in a much more complicated looking way. But if you write it in two spinners, it becomes completely obvious. But then I started worrying about the conformal invariance of these equations. And it, I was just struck by this curious fact that that equation is conformally invariant with a particular weighting, conformal weighting for the spinner. And we already have the interpretation of the vial curvature as being uh, the conformal curvature. And therefore, it has a, another conformal interpretation. So it's a conformal object. But the weighting is different. Mm. You have two different conformal weightings. And it just strike me, struck me there's something important here. And I had no idea what it was. <laughs> well, so it was only much, much later when I realized it is absolutely crucial in a certain way, which comes to this leap ahead. Yes, cosmology now we're now coming on to your yes. most recent. Well, you were asking me about, about the, the well, about second law and, and what I thought was important. And yeah. this big problem, you see, for a long, long time, I just thought, like everybody else, that the Big Bang, to understand it, we need quantum gravity. I mean, that's the that's this conventional view. We need quantum gravity. Maybe it's string theory quantum gravity. Maybe it's loop quantum gravity. Maybe it's this kind of quantum gravity or the other kind of quantum gravity or twisted quantum gravity. But it's quantum gravity. Now, that means to me, or meant to me, quantum gravity must be a jolly funny theory because the singularity, you see, one of the reasons you're studying quantum gravity is to explain the Big Bang singularity. Where do you all see, all see other singularities? Black holes. They're utterly, completely different. People used to say, well, you know, you've got singularities in the black holes. Doesn't that tell you you've got singularities in the Big Bang? You've got singularities in the Big Bang, therefore in the black holes. Just the same thing, time's going the other way around. But it's not. <laughs> They're utterly different. But it's this entropy thing. The singularities in black holes are absolutely wild. The curvature, vile curvature goes completely dominates, wilds, oscillates all over the place. Complete, complete madness. In the Big Bang, 
calm as you could imagine. <laughs> Think of the Big Bang as a great violent thing, but it's, <laughs> but it's utterly regular. Gravitational degrees of freedom simply not activated. Now, what kind of quantum gravity is going to give you these two utterly different extremes in the black hole, complete domination by the vial curvature, in the Big Bang, vial curvature seems to be zero, or at least very, very suppressed. Uh, OK, my view then was to say, oh, well, quantum gravity must be a jolly funny theory with the time, uh, not time asymmetric. And if we're going to find quantum gravity theory, you've got to put in time asymmetry somewhere, you see. So that was my view until, well, I guess uh, about eight or nine years, I forget how long ago now it was, um, eight or nine years ago. I just had this idea, I was thinking about, uh, well, it took me a long time to be persuaded, when I say a long time, maybe about three years, to be persuaded that the observations of these distant supernovae made by Perlmutter, Perlmutter and Schmidt and, and uh, Rees had, had um, convincingly showed that their universe is accelerating in its expansion. And they, it was all sort of touted as being this totally mysterious thing that nobody could understand, totally unexpected. Yes. And I should say, well, go and look at all, all the yes, cosmology I books. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmological constant. Yeah. It's in all the cosmology books. I don't know why they thought it was mysterious. Why it should... I think we should explain. We're talking about yeah. dark, dark, dark energy, energy that's uh, right, which dark we think energy. is neither dark nor, nor energy. Nor indeed. energy. It's yeah. a very bad name, very bad name. But nevertheless, that's what people call it. And it's, it's there, apparently. Fits in absolutely perfectly, as far as we know now, with what it, the term Einstein introduced in 1917 for admittedly the wrong reason. I mean, he wanted a static universe. Well, half of it's right, and it's the only, yeah. it's the only modification you can make that's generally covered. Absolutely, I mean, that's, yes. That's, it's not that's just right. a term. It's, it's not just a term. It is the one thing you can do to general relativity without wrecking it, yeah. basically. Yes, without changing it in a ra radical way. That's right. And so often I would take it into consideration in the asymptotics, the work I did in trying to look at radio, uh, squashing infinity down yes. and making infinity look like a finite boundary. And you can use the conformal invariance of Maxwell's equations or of, the, of this equation that you get for yeah. the propagation of gravitons, if you like. It tells you what, how to study radiation field by looking at infinity. And I also knew that if there was a cosmological constant which was positive, this surface would be space-like. It would be null if it's null, zero cosmological constant, time light if it's negative cosmological constant. Fortunately, it's not negative because that causes all sorts of problems, <laughs> even though the string theorists seem to like it. Um, <coughs> the positive cosmological constant is a completely different class of problems. I used to think it had bad features on reflection. It seemed to me they were just unusual features. But now it was absolutely crucial, mm. because I was thinking about the very remote future and how boring it was going to be in the very remote future. All the black holes eventually disappear by Hawking evaporation, and there's nothing left of any interest, and this goes on to eternity. But to me, eternity is not such a long time, because I'm used to thinking of compressing it down by these conformal scalings. This is what I mean by <laughs> defe defeating time in more than one way, Roger. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, the argument was basically... Of, yeah, I mean, yeah. I tend to use this in lectures as a sort of joke. <laughs> but it's a real argument, you know, that the universe gets so incredibly boring but there won't be anybody of us, any of us around to be bored by it. Mainly it's photons, and you can't very bore photons very easily. And so photons just go straight into this boundary. And the picture I was having and getting very used to was the idea of a boundary, which you, if you've just got mass of things, that boundary is like anywhere else. And then the thought occurred to me, well, you've got a space-like boundary for the Big Bang. Why don't you put them together? So it's an outrageous thought. And I gave lectures on this, usually being careful to call it an outrageous idea before anybody else said it was outrageous. <laughs> but uh, as the years went by, I began to think more. Well, I, I think originally I would have given it a, a reasonable chance of being right. Reasonable chance, maybe not 50%. There's more substance, isn't there, through Paul Todd's 
work and the yes. well you see yeah. Paul Todd yeah. yes see Paul Todd I had the thing I called the viral curvature hypothesis which was to say that the viral curvature as just a hypothesis a way of characterizing the, the, the Big Bang that it, as you have an initial type singularity like the Big Bang the viral curvature should be zero but that's awkward to say because it's a singular state what do you mean by a tensor when it's singular and so on so Paul had a much neater way of expressing it, which was to say, you stretch it out, you stretch out the Big Bang by a conformal factor, which is something we did all the time for yes. the Friedman models. That was quite a standard thing. But to make that the condition on the Big Bang, I think, is, is an important step. As Paul has originally, it only makes the vial curvature finite, not necessarily zero. But as I already knew, the infinity, the vial curvature must be zero because of the way these things scale, as I said before. That mm. Because there's a conformal factor in the scaling, it must scale the vial curvature to zero. So if you stick them together, the zero vial curvature must propagate through to be zero on the next eon. So I started playing around with these ideas, half thinking it was completely crazy, I suppose, and half thinking it's probably right. <laughs> And we end up with looking for circles in the sky, yes, which yes. is absolutely, actually something we can actually see, something to do it's with the Mobius transformations on the sphere. What, oh, could, well be that's more what could be more beautiful it's, as it's a, a s prediction? It's, well, <laughs> you see, I was beginning, I, this didn't occur immediately. I, I was trying, people would ask me about, you know, how could you tell if this is right? And I thought sort of rather wrongly about gravitational radiation or something. But it was later that it occurred to me, what's the most violent thing that could happen that we, might be a signal getting through? And so I was thinking of these <coughs> collisions between supermassive black holes. You see, we're on a collision course with Andromeda, the Andromeda Nebula, and it has a black hole which is, I forget, 20, 50 times bigger than ours. And uh, we have a, uh, a 4 million solar mass black hole, and it's got a bigger one. And they could on our collision course, they might well capture each other, spiral around, boom. When they swallow each other up, there'll be one huge explosion in the form almost entirely of gravitational waves. Now these gravitational waves, as I'm used to, you've got the boundary, they will come and they'll hit the boundary in a definite place. What will they do when they get through? Well, because of the scalings, they can't exist as gravitational waves on the other side they have to scale down into another form. And the equations tell us that you have to have a new dark, now again, the word dark isn't a very good one, but I think on, on the conformal cyclic cosmology scheme, which is what I'm talking about here, simply, uh, acronym or what do you call it, CCC, uh, is this scheme tells us that the gravitation, the information in the gravitational waves propagates across, but in the form of disturbances in this initial ma dark matter. So you have dark material created, and it will be given a kick by this gravitational wave impulse. So in fact, you have another prediction, apart from the, the circular features corresponding to the, the, no, the these outgoing the, these gravitational waves, of, the, yes, of yes. the gravitational radiation, and you have a prediction for what dark matter will turn out yes, to be, which is quite different. That is true. People looking it is for quite different. Shots and, and I haven't that, shouted yeah. about that one yes. particularly because, yeah. I mean, it's, it's I, what I call the initial form of dark matter because it's massless originally. It has to be massless, but the equations also tell you that you have to grow mass so that you can't keep massless. There's just an inconsistency. So the mass has to occur. It must be tied in with Higgs mechanisms and so on. It, it hasn't been as yet properly. But I think one has to understand more about particle physics. How does the Higgs mechanism, new the creation of mass in the early universe, relate to the appearance of mass, which comes in from the equations that you have here? This is another huge area of your thought, really, is how conformal yeah. symmetry is broken yes. and the different yes, ways yes. in which it's broken, which we yes. see much more clearly by expressing things in twisted geometric terms. So yes. you see the breaking explicitly, but there are yes. all these different aspects to it. Uh, I've always been in two minds about yeah. that, yes. I suppose the cosmological constant has changed a bit because I used to think mm. one of my minds was that you have the... If there's no cosmological constant, you have this sort of Poincaré group, 
twisters, and that's you have a sort of exact sequence, and the exact sequences play a big role in a lot of cohomology and twister theory and so on. But if you have a cosmological constant, you don't quite have an exact sequence. You have something which is invertible, and it changes one's attitude. So I think that was a shift. The cosmological constant took me a little while to get used to, but with the cosmology, it comes absolutely crucial. Yes. You can't you can't do this cosmology without a cosmological constant. So you must have dark energy, as it's called, and you must have dark matter, as it's called, because there has to be a new created scalar material every time you go from one eon to the next. And so therefore, in order that it is not to pile up, it's got to decay away too. So it must, uh, throughout the history of each eon, the dark matter f decays away, which I believe there is some rather feeble evidence for. I don't know how much to trust it. I see, it must decay rather than clump together, which uh, is, yes. is, is the, well, it otherwise it, black well, it hole could for a bit, but then it must eventually decay. It, it must decay. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise it will build up. Yes. And then it'll just build up from eon to eon, and yeah. then you won't have, have a way of propagating. So I think it's got to decay. But there are some... Uh, it's not The evidence is not very strong, but I heard two bits of evidence. One was from a lecture given by Stephen Weinberg, when he seemed to suggest that the density... The, the proportion of dark matter was larger in the very early universe than it is now. Uh -huh. The other thing I picked up on. Now, none of these things, neither of these things may be right, but I just picked up on them because they <laughs> sort of fitted in with what I was thinking. The other one was there are observations of, of per annihilation, I think, in, in the region near the center, well, of positrons, I think that's what it is, that you see positrons or something in the region near the center of the, of the are galaxy. Are they with these decay products? Uh, the I think there is a view, it may not, yeah. uh, there may be lots of views, that it may be a, a decay product of, of dark matter. I have no idea. Then no, not yeah. directly into photons, they would go through. Imagine. They go through, uh, yeah, not photons, but some, yeah. I, I don't have strong views on that, but it, but it would, it would have to go eventually, yeah. So dark matter, yes, but then the other thing, there's a more recent thing too. <laughs> it's, it, it may explain lots of things. You see, of course, lots of that's all the better because there may be things that could contradict it, and if there are things that can contradict it. As Bondi used to say with the steady state model, yes. the beauty of the steady state <laughs> model was that, is that it could be contradicted, and of course it was. Oh, <laughs> yes. So one has to look out for these things. But there is this uh, um, information which was released um, <coughs> in March of this year, 2014, about these what are called bicep two observations where the claim is, or was, has been, that this is the smoking gun of inflation. I haven't said anything about inflation, but I should say that in this model of mine, CCC, inflation can't be there. It would spoil things. Inflation is supposed to have been this exponential expansion, which is supposed to have taken place in the very, very early stages of the universe. Initially, the reasons put forward were ones that I always thought were just incorrect, having to do with the uniformity of the universe. And that only works if you've got a uniformity there or or originally. It doesn't. You can see from general arguments that can't be an argument. There are good reasons, though, that kept inflation going, one of them being the scale invariance of the fluctuations in temperatures that you see in the microwave background. And if you don't have inflation, you need another explanation. So to me, in a sense, there was inflation. That was the exponential expansion of the eon prior to ours, which is similar to an idea that Veneziano put forward some years before this scheme of mine. So uh, it's not a bad idea. But there are now much stronger constraints on what the inflationary... I mean, for people who... I mean, yes. For inflationists on what they can viably... Well, it, it the B modes that they claim to see, these are polarization, mm. uh, uh, photon polarizations that are seen, probably do are correctly seen, in, in the early universe. But the conclusion that is made is that you see these things which couldn't arise from purely magnetic for features. They have to be, sorry, purely electric, they have to be magnetic. Uh, they, you get curls, which you couldn't have if it was purely electric. Now, Paul Todd was talking to me earlier this year about um, problems that there were about the creation of 
primordial magnetic fields, and there are difficulties in ordinary cosmology about where they come from. You apparently see them in magnetic fields in these voids, regions where there are no galaxies. What, how on earth did the magnetic fields come about? And the view seems to be that they must have been there right from the Big Bang. Mm. And those would produce B-modes. Mm. So the idea is not just that the B-modes that claim, are claimed to be the smoking gun of inflation are nothing of the sort, but are primordial magnetic fields. And that those magnetic fields, according to the suggestion that Paul made to me, is that maybe they came through from the previous eon, which they would on this scheme because they'd be attached to galactic clusters and those little places where the galactic cluster impinges on the crossover surface, you'll have magnetic fields. And then there was just very recently, um, I, I was hearing about these things, you see, and was very rather alarmed by the BMOs and the fact that this seemed to be proving inflation, so everybody said, since that would disprove CCC, you see, inflation can't coexist with it for various reasons. So uh, I began thinking, well, maybe these are the things Paul's claiming should be there. And then I um, emailed my colleague, Varhe Gozijan, who had uh, been the person initially who'd, who had seen the evidence of these circular features, concentric circular features, because these would be, each time there's a, an, a black hole collision in a galactic cluster, there would be boom, you see, that's one ring. A little bit later, another one, boom, there's another ring. And these would always be concentric because the central point is where that galactic cluster ends up as. So he was looking for, looking at at least three rings where the variance, the variation of temperature around the ring is lower by a certain amount than the average. And this was the test we were using to, for these things. And he claims to see lots of indications of these things, very non-isotropic over the sky. Certain regions were huge numbers of them, other regions were practically nothing. So when I heard about the B modes, I said, well, uh, I emailed Varhe, he says, yeah. where is this region they're seeing these things? Can you pinpoint it on the sky? So he put a little ring and said, it's in here. And this was in, in his Planck map. So this was the recent, more recent, the old ones were the W map ones that he looked at. The Planck map ones, and I looked at his picture, nothing whatsoever in there. So I thought, oh dear. <laughs> so I looked back at the older W map ones, same place, and bang, there was a triple of rings right in the middle. So then I emailed Vahe and I said, well, um, why don't I see them in the Planck data? So he said, oh, well, I'll turn up the volume a bit. He didn't say it quite like that. Looking at slightly lower signals, and there, there they are, absolutely right in the middle. Moreover, moreover, if these are Paul Todd's, uh, well, if, if the BMOs really are magnetic fields, and if these rings are really from that galactic cluster in the previous eon, it's only just on the edge, just from the geometry. It has to be where our past light cone hits where the galactic cluster ends up. And therefore, the temperature of these rings must be average. See, the, the distant ones, the signals coming towards us and therefore warmer, the close ones are signals going away from us and therefore cooler. The ones which are just on the edge would be of average temperature. I look at these rings, they're right, the color coding is green, which means right in the middle. So this is sort of exciting. Yes, that is. Yes. If this is right, when we could make prediction, well, we make the predictions anyway, but we'll see what the, because the Planck data hasn't come up out yet on this. And so it looks as though we might make a prediction of the sorts of places to look for where you should see B modes. Because those, in, if that's right, see this is a second observational feature of, of the scheme. But nobody pays any attention to the first one yet. <laughs> it's been almost completely ignored. I mean there were uh, exciting verifications of this that we had last of September. Yes, the, yeah. Well, well um, Christoph Meisner gave a very yeah. nice talk where he yeah. explained his analysis, which is quite different from, from, yeah. from Varhe Gurzajan's analysis. And he also saw significant I evidence for these rings. Yes. Know, yes. Looked at in a different way, but yes, yes it's the same, the same feature. But again, no, no attention paid. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, on some slightly different subject of predictions, how do you think things stand on the evidence for quantum mechanical dependence of biological structure yeah. in the brain? I mean, this is something well, else that you... There have been some interesting things in, in recent years, yes. Um, well, you see, first, I should explain that, you see, I wrote my book, The Emperor's New Mind, hoping that by the time I got to the end of the book, I would have some inkling of <laughs> how quantum effects could be relevant to action of brain, and I couldn't. There mm. wasn't, it, wasn't I, it kind of petered out there. But it did have the advantage, I mean, I thought maybe I would inspire young people to do physics or something. Uh, it was more either ancient retired people who wrote <laughs> to me, or else it was somebody in other scientific subjects, and one of these was Stuart Hameroff, who did read my book, and he said, well, look, you may not know about these things called microtubules. Let's just show my ignorance. I'd never heard of them at that time. These are the things that in mitosis, when a cell divides, you see the chromosomes being pulled apart, and these microtubules are dragging them apart. They play all sorts of roles in cells generally, but they seem to have a particular role, according to Stuart anyway, Stuart Hameroff, they play a particular role in consciousness in the brain. And his business, professional activity, is putting people to sleep as an anesthesiologist in Arizona. <coughs> and so, unlike maybe many of his colleagues who are just interested in putting people to sleep, he's sort of interested in actually what he's doing when he's putting people to sleep. So, and his idea has been, and he tells me that there is now some good evidence that this is the case, that general anesthetics do act on directly on microtubules. So these are little t nanoscale tubes, which are in, in all sorts of, almost all cells in the body um, and in neurons. But the argument is that they have a different role in neurons um, and that they play a central role in consciousness. Something very interesting has come up on, well, several things. One is some observation about where you can track where the consciousness kind of appears, what part of the brain is involved. And one thing that always worried me for a long time about most explanations of consciousness in terms of computation or something is why is the cerebellum not conscious? It seems to be entirely unconscious. Yet, there are about half as many neurons as in the brain and far more connections between neurons in the cerebellum than in the mm. cerebrum. Yet, the cerebrum seems to be where consciousness comes about. Well, these new observations have to do with these things called pyramidal cells. Pyramidal cells. I don't know how you quite pronounce it. Exactly. Pyramidal cells, which are particularly they're sort of cells which look like pyramids, I suppose. But they don't occur in the cerebellum at all. They occur in a certain part of the brain, which is now identified as a as a major part where consciousness does come about, and they are absolutely packed with microtubules, apparently. So this is an int one interesting development. It's, it sort of sh alters the picture somewhat. But I've always been worried by why the cerebellum, with all these connections and so on, why isn't that indicate? Why is that unconscious? But it seems to be it doesn't have these particular types of cells, and that may be a crucial thing. But the other important development has to do with the experimental findings of um, um, Anaben Bandiyapadhyay who has been doing experiments largely in Japan with colleagues. He's an Indian doing experiments there. And on individual microtubules, where they measure the resistance with particular frequencies, he finds that there are very particular frequencies where the thing becomes extremely conductive hmm. in ways which are quite unlike classical conduction. Um, you see, I had the complicated roundabout route for thinking that quantum mechanics has to be playing a role, and not just quantum mechanics, but beyond quantum mechanics. See, it's not just outrageous, because people used to think, oh, well, brain is all wet and messy, and how can you have coherent quantum mechanics going on there? Uh, but I'm saying not only that, it's got to be at the level, extended to the level where you start to see divergence from standard quantum mm. mechanics. Mm. Now, that's totally out outrageous, you see. But my reasoning came from the girdle things, mm -hmm and saying, well, it really seems that uh, um, our understanding cannot be something of a purely computational character. And it's very interesting because, of course, with Turing, 
it seemed in his early years he was very I think he would have been very alive to these yes, questions yes, and much yes. more than people who followed I can, I can uh, his computational yes. model uh, yes. as a doc I mean as a because he wrote this paper on ordinal logics and which was trying to you know go and beyond systems and yeah I mean it's, it's yes. di very difficult to tell I mean I think the success of computational methods during the war really got him going I know, think to explore how true. much you could go yes. in that direction but he was certainly worried about the yeah, the fact that yeah. quantum physics is actually quantum mechanical. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, he was alive to that in a way that yeah. other people not exposed That's to. Right. But then you see, the normally one would think you could you could compute at least to any degree of accuracy, as a sort of argument yeah. that Turing himself would make, that what have what the Schrödinger equation does. But then the standard quantum mechanics, you then have to use the Schrödinger equation only as probabilistic. But then you have to have a measurement. Well, he was very aware of the reduction. Yes, yes that's that right. Being, being ruled too. Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. you got that directly yeah. from von Neumann. Von Neumann, that's right. Yes, too, yes. Which is probably also how you would yes, have approached no, it yes, also. Yes, sure. uh, yes, I was right from the f first principle. aware of that very much. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So, uh, but what's interesting is that now, in biology, it's not just in these microtubules, because that's Bandia Padjahai's ob yeah. observations, which do seem to indicate Something very strange is going on in microtubules, which certainly is not classical. And how you explain it quantum mechanically? Well, that's people don't even know how to explain high temperature superconductivity properly yet. So there's, there are lots of things to understand there. But now we know photosynthesis involves um, entanglements, quant essentially quantum mechanical effects. Some things about um, navi bird, bird navigation, is it? I think it is, yes, something. And, uh, sensitivity to magnetic fields or something. These, these things do seem to tell us that there is a lot more going on in biology which you simply can't explain purely classically, apart from, apart from chemistry, which is already quantum mechanical. <laughs> but uh, you see, I'm saying you've got to have enough quantum mechanics that it's coherent across many neurons in a way which allows sufficient displacement of mass according to the scheme that I trying to develop with, well, Dioshi originally had a scheme like this, and then for different, with different motivations, I picked up on an idea very similar, which is that when in superpositions, if there's a mass, enough mass displacement, then it goes over into a classical alternatives. But this is very frowned upon by most quantum mechanics people, because they think that quantum mechanics has to hold invariably at all levels. But all experiments to date, have only been at a level where you don't probe this re area. So there's experiments hiding in the wings there too. Well, thank you very much, Roger, for giving this time. Well, time again, has, uh, <laughs> time is dominating our Well, it's been a great pleasure for me. It's always a pleasure to talk about these things and try to rake up ideas. Ah, <laughs> and maybe inspire someone who's watching this to think. Uh, it would be nice. Yes, it would be really nice. Who knows? Yeah. Right.